Well, welcome everyone uh, and thank you for joining us today for this Center for Jewish Studies uh, community lecture with Professor Magda Tedder. I'm Daniel Schrader, I'm the director of the Center for Jewish Studies and a professor of history at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we would like to thank our uh, University of Minnesota co-sponsors, the Department of History, the Center for Austrian Studies, Center for Medieval Studies, Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and the JCRC of Minnesota and the Dakotas. Special thanks to uh, uh, Natan Paradise, um, our, who I can introduce here, uh, our Associate Director, the Center for Jewish Studies, and thank you also to Mario uh, Coulter, our outreach and program coordinator for all their help in organizing this event today. I want to express my gratitude also for um, a generous gift, in memory of Julia Kay and Harold Segal, for which we're really, really grateful for helping um, uh, make our lecture series possible. I want to say here that we originally planned to have Professor Tater in person uh, last spring, but we sadly had to cancel our plans because of COVID. And of course, we would have liked to, uh, to see uh, Magda here in person this year. Um, and unfortunately, it still wasn't possible, but we, we're, we're really so grateful for uh, Professor Tedder, uh, who graciously agreed to take part again in our lecture series this year and in this webinar format uh, today. And, and, I, and we also want to thank all of you for those, those of you who were hoping to, to see Professor Tedder in person last year to, to have returned to us um, this year in the, for, the, for the webinar. Uh, so it's now my privilege to introduce uh, Magda Tedder, who is a professor of history and the Fiedler Chair in Judaic uh, Studies at Fordham University. Uh, she she is, uh, was born and raised in Poland, um, received a PhD uh, from Columbia University, uh, and is an internationally renowned scholar uh, and author uh, in the field of early modern Jewish history. Uh, she is the recipient, recipient of many fellowships and, and awards. Uh, I'm not going to enumerate all of them here, but among them uh, is, is the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Award and the Harry Frank Guggenheim uh, Foundation uh, Award uh, Fellowship as well. Um, Professor Tedder is the author of many uh, uh, works and studies uh, and many acclaimed uh, books, including Sinners on Trial, Jews and Sacrilege after the Reformation, uh, Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, and now most recently, Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, uh, which just won the National Jewish Book Award and which is the subject of today's lecture. So I wanna ask uh, that you please submit questions and comments in writing under Q&A, which you'll see on, your, uh, on the bottom. Uh, and uh, we will communicate them to uh, Professor Tedder following, well, following the lecture, we will have some time for, for uh, Q&A. Um, I just want to say also, because there are many people in attendance today, we apologize in advance if we, we don't get to all of your questions. So with no further ado, I turn the virtual podium over to Professor Tedder. Magda, please. Thank you so much, uh, Danielle, uh, Professor Schroeder, for introducing me, for inviting me. It's been a long effort of in the making and I am really honored to be part of your community and, uh, and thank you for welcoming me. 
Um, it is too bad we can't do it in person, but hopefully at some point uh, we will I will have a chance to return to University of Minnesota and uh, and visit with you as well. Um, I before I start before I share my screen, I just want to say that when I started this book as, as scholars of the pre modern period, I had no idea that it would become a relevant book we sometimes wish our work that deals with topics before the 1900s is relevant but i find myself saying that be careful what you wish for or choose a, a more fun topic and maybe then when it's relevant it brings happier times so um when i uh, when i started the uh the book project it was really a historical uh, study, comparative study between Poland and Italy uh, in the 17th, 18th century, because that's where the cases I, I was noticing. But as I was writing, uh, it became clear that this topic is very much sadly alive. Um, so Facebook was asked to, um, it was hosting a, a page called Jewish Ritual Murder for people. You could see at some point I screenshotted, it, it had almost 800 likes and followers. It was uh, removed in 2018. Um, in 2015, a group of white supremacists in uh, Great Britain visited the shrine of uh, uh, what they consider shrine of Hugh of Lincoln, whom they call a saint. He was never um, recognized as a saint, but they call him a saint. Um, the uh, Middle Eastern anti-Israeli uh, propaganda often produces um, cartoons and iconography that draws directly from really the pre-modern um, uh, visual sources that are then translated and adjusted to and used in contemporary Middle East. Um, and then as my book was going into production, uh, the shooting happened in, the, in near San Diego uh, in a Poe synagogue and the shooter's manifesto mentioned the one of the characters of my book, um, Simon of Trent. And uh, as a motive, motivate, mo motive for uh, his, one of the motives for the, for the shootings. And then after the book was published, the topic didn't want to go away. Uh, this awful painting was painted by a, a, a painter in Italy and it required the Catholic Church in Italy issue a statement condemning it as a form of Christian devotion and highlighting the uh, sin of anti-Semitism. So the topic was sadly, um, sadly relevant and today in the United States it uh, rain, rain, resurfaced in another form uh, with the QAnon uh, conspiracy theories. So, but typically um, blood libels, that is accusations that Jews killed Christian children um, for the use of their blood um, started in the medieval period. The, the, the blood motif really is added in the 13th century, but the first accusations uh, or the first stories uh, uh, emerge in the late 12th century in England. So it's usually perceived as a medieval story, as a, as a medieval accusation. And I, um, the book, uh, my book has a website, which you can see, and these maps are interactive here, they're static, uh, but you can go on the website and play with the, with the maps uh, and, and uh, different, different combinations. So what we see in the medieval period, which I roughly end in 1450, the year of the development of the printing press that really changes the way knowledge is, is transmitted and culture in uh, Europe, we see about 23 stories. 
And the majority of them are known only from literary sources. So from some chronicles, from some kind of tales. Um, only six are known from more reliable sources that can testify that some accusation happened, that it's not just a story. So whether it's a papal bull condemning such accusation, imperial decree, or actually evidence of a trial. But when, when we look at the later period, and I'm just stopping here um, uh, in 1830 in this map, but there were in 1880s, in the, in early ninth and early 20th century, there is a resurgence of uh, blood accusation. The, um, the last one that is true happy is in, in Kiev, the Mendel Bailey's trial that really follows that motif of blood accusation and Passover. Um, but for my book really ends, uh, ends in, the, uh, in, in, this, in this period at the end of the 18th century. And you can see a huge difference between the medieval and the early modern period. And one is the shift eastward. And the other one, you see the shift in the type of materials and sources we, we learn from. So we see that the majority of the stories, cases, become actually cases because we have legal evidence. And suddenly you see this is not a medieval tale. This is a very much early modern and modern, as we've seen, tale. The other thing that, that um, as I was mapping and dealing with the different types of evidence and what can we say that things happen where only rumors uh, re reported, how, how, uh, what are the, the results, were the outcomes. I looked at how the stories um, or actual legal evidence um, show the out outcomes, where, whether Jews were persecuted and whether Jews were in fact executed after, after such proceedings. And in the medieval period, as we've seen the 23 stories that we know of, um, eight, we don't know any, it's just a mention that there was some sort of accusation, one line in a in a, some chronicle. Uh, and in eight cases, Jews were persecuted or are told or are said to have been uh, persecuted. And then in uh, seven, they were acquitted and let free. Um, and this is again, the literary and the legal sources. This changes somewhat differently. We have a more legal cases. Um, but still, the, even though the memory of in Jewish history of those accusations is that Jews were always uh, persecuted and then executed, the majority nonetheless uh, of those stories still, even uh, in the period where the accusations dominate, um, were that Jews were in fact let free and uh, not uh, they may have been prosecuted, but they were not persecuted in a sense that they were let free. Uh, on a, I could document 23 cases in which, um, in which Jews were in fact executed, still quite a bit. Uh, and again, the, sh the, the shift between the legal, and this is a map that captures 12, uh, 1240 to 15, uh, 40. The reason why I chose this range is because 1247 is the papal bull issued by Innocent IV condemning anti-Jewish accusations, accusing Jews of killing Christian children. And uh, the last such papal condemnation was in 1540, and I'll explain why this was the last papal condemnation. But you can see that in that period, when there were um, official statements condemning it, there were 31 cases, 31, at least 17 cases, for, uh, 14 were are known from literary sources alone. Uh, so we don't know whether they were, they happened. But when you look at the period after 1540, when the, um, 
the, the Pope stopped officially defending Jews against such accusations, you have a huge rise of, uh, of cases, right? Legal cases are now 43. So there is a very important shift, which to me, and this is one of the stories that the book tells, the importance of leadership, the importance of public condemnations, public pronouncements, they will not prevent attacks, hatred, but they give tools to those who want to prevent those. And again, we can see that in this, uh, just in that mapping. The reason why um, there is this shift after 1540 and the last, uh, last uh, um, papal condemnation comes at that moment in 1540 and no more afterwards is the story of Simon of Trent. Not the first one in Europe and not the last one in Europe as we've seen, but one that had a pivotal uh, significance. So in uh, 1475, uh, just a, a toddler of under three years old was found dead in a canal flowing under the house of a Jewish family in the northern, now northern Italian town of Trento. Um, and soon Jews were suspected of killing, killing him. Uh, and a, a big trial ensued. Um, the Pope actually uh, sent a, a emissary uh, to investigate whether this accusation was tru truthful, whether the trial was uh, justified, but the, also because the local bishop immediately seized on the opportunity when the boy was, boy's body was found and began to create a local cult, a uh, cult of the, Bia uh, the blessed Simon, little Simon. Uh, already days, just a couple of days after his body is found in, uh, in the Easter Passover season. So the bishop immediately does it. Now 1475 is a jubilee year and there are many pilgrims traveling to Rome from across the Europe. The bishop wanted to monetize on those uh, pilgrims to stop in his town. The story is quite complex how it happened, but 1475 is also just a few decades after one of the major revolutions in, uh, in European history and world history, the invention of the printing press. Much like the internet today, it revolutionized how people transmitted information. And the bishop immediately uses this new technology to disseminate the story and to visualize it. And here is one of the earliest uh, broadsides. It was just a sheet with an image of the uh, su supposed murder of Simon by Jews. Uh, it is hand painted, so it was just black and white when it was printed, but it, for the first time, it massively allowed to visualize a story that may have been mentioned before in just one line in a chronicle. Now there was a narrative and now there were images. And in fact, we do not have before 1475, we do not have many, if any, examples of visualizing this uh, this libel, this accusation. It comes all thanks to the investment by this Bishop of Trent in this new media. So he pays for those, um, for the images, he pays uh, for the story. This is, um, Simon is found dead on Easter Sunday, which is March 20, uh, 26th, 1475 on April 4th, before the trial even starts in full, um, there is already a narrative. There's already a full story of the martyrdom of little Simon that is printed in, uh, in Rome and, uh, and is disseminated across, the, um, across Europe. There are, again, this is also a one sheet 
There are also stories of pilgrims being healed um, that is that are, uh, are are disseminated. This is a German pamphlet of showing German pilgrims to the body of the little uh, little boy, and you can see here uh, the uh, the vota, the uh, the symbols of what the healing happened, and then this uh, this body, um, and then. Uh, and this this particular uh, uh, publication is really important because it's one of the first, if not the first, publication where images are not just generic images that are used and can be reused in different books, but where the image and the text um, correspond. So this is a 12 page, 12 sheet uh, book that has the text telling the story and the illustration right next to it, uh, showing this uh, whole plot of, of Jews plotting to kidnap Simon, um, kidnapping the boy, uh, torturing him, and then the finding of the body, the, uh, the cult, the creation of the veneration site and pilgrims coming in, and then the punishment of those uh, deemed by the bishop and the local authorities as uh, as uh, a culp as culpable of the uh, of the murder. So you can see this really marshalling of the new technology and of the visual. The bishop very much understands the power of the image uh, as opposed to just the text. Although he does sponsor songs and tales in both Latin and the vernacular languages that are published and disseminated. Um, the Rome and the Pope consider this effort to make Simon a saint uh, illegitimate. The, the Pope actually condemns all the efforts. He condemns the bishop for his sponsoring of art. He prohibits any worship, any devotion to Simon and any pr production of art. But the horses are out of the barn. The images are spread by print and they are then also used uh, and, uh, and uh, brought uh, and painted in churches uh, in, the, in the region. And we have this blossoming of, of what I call simonine art um, that is in, um, in Northern Italy. It creates facts on the ground. So when the uh, bishops of, of, from all over Europe come back to Trento, to Trent for the, uh, after the Reformation for the Council of Trent, they see the facts on the ground. The existence of the cult, even though it's not recognized by Rome, they see the uh, art in churches, we, they see all kinds of things. It leads eventually in 1580s to the recognition of the cult by, the, by Rome uh, and in insertion of Simon into a liturgical calendar uh, that is reformed with the Gregorian calendar. And here you are seeing one of those devotional images in a Northern Italian church in Spoleto and uh, to the right, a printed liturgy for Simon. Now you will notice that there is S. Simon for Saint Simon. He was not rec ever, ever recognized as saint. Uh, but the Pope in 1583 acquiesced uh, to, in 1588 with official bull, to allowing him to be um, worshiped as a beatus, as a blessed uh, boy for a local cult. This is the reason why uh, oops why the popes then um, then uh, prohibit um, the, uh, the, the don't intervene anymore in the, in uh, on behalf of Jews because he is recognized as by the Pope and he is inserted into a liturgical calendar and therefore he's the first quote unquote, supposed victim of Jews recognized and inserted in liturgy. Uh, and that creates problems for the church. Um, but the story spreads. The story is now 
not only in those little pamphlets, but it enters a, um, a chronicle, massive learned chronicles that talk about the history of the world from creation until wherever the chronicle ends. And this image um, to the left, you probably have encountered. It's a classic image that is used by both anti-Semites and scholars to discuss um, blood libel accusations, blood libels. Um, but this image actually was kind of lost to history after 1475. Um, there is, uh, a, a, the, the story is in a, a reported here uh, and the image is here and it's only reproduced uh, here in this pirated edition, but otherwise the image is lost. We'll see it again later on. But the, the imagery is, spreads and it's it and it's adapted so here you have what that image uh represented as the as the passion of simon that really becomes popular that that depiction of the killing in northern europe um and you can see another example of really reused images so you can see that this image is frequently reused um, and that is typical iconography of Northern Europe, especially German lands, and then later on in Eastern Europe. Um, other stories, with Simon, other stories are included in these chronicles. And here you have a story of William of Norwich, who was supposed to have been killed in, 14, in 1144, the very first one in, uh, in England. And, this is what I mean by one sentence story. That's here. I don't know whether you can see my screen, but this, this uh, one sentence just below the, uh, this, this figure of uh, Petrus Com Commodore uh, next to the image of this boy being crucified is all that was known about, uh, about uh, William of Norwich. But that story enters those world histories and again the use of images. Then it enters really um, respectable sources, also by Protestants. Here is Sebastian Münster's Cosmographia, which was a depiction of the world, and it is again signaling with the the image of the of the child that there is this uh this uh, story about jews killing christian children and here you have another uh, copy of different editions that also signal these anti-jewish stories and here is another one also uh this one is from uh, Ger germany uh again um so these the imagery and the story spreads like wildfire, which then is used, these books are used as evidence to accuse Jews. And that's one of the reason why we see this huge rise of accusations that end up also in court after uh, si the story of Simon after 1475, thanks to the dissemination of those stories and the imagery and print. What you see on this image, you have Simon of Trent uh, to the um, left um, uh, with the with the pig, the image of the Yudan Sao of of uh, and Simon as a corpse above, and that image was in depicted in Frankfurt Gate entering into the city, and here is another story. Uh, that is also illustrated from Bavaria, another accusation of Jews, uh, five, that Jews supposedly killed five boys. So again, you can see certain similar tropes when you look at the image here and you look back at, oops, sorry, this image, very similar um, iconography that is again replicated in these stories. So here is an image of that intro introduction of the story of Simon in the liturgy and the cause of the end of papal condemnations against anti-Jewish accusations. Um, from then on, Jews, th this became a justification for 
anti-Jewish accusation. And that comes into literature, especially in Eastern Europe, in Poland. Here are two examples of anti-Jewish literature that begins to flourish at the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century after the introduction of Simon in the liturgy. Uh, and this is the effect that 1580 in, in insertion of Simon into the uh, martyrological calendar, the liturgical calendar of the Catholic Church and, uh, and the number of accusations, 54 here you see between 1580 and 1800 and the majority of them had in fact legal proceedings. So when Jews were accused, when you see all these accusations coming in Eastern Europe, they tried to reach Rome. They knew that the popes had condemned uh, such accusations in the past, but they don't succeed. The pope's hands are in some way uh, tied because of that story of Simon. So here you have archival evidence of Jews reaching Rome and trying to get condemnations, but they only get a letter from a Dominican order um, condemning such accusations. Here is another example during a wave of anti-Jewish accusations, really horrific anti-Jewish accusations in the second half of the, or in the middle of the 18th century, Polish Jews reach Rome, reach um, the, the, the Pope uh, by letters, um, it, seeking an intervention, a re renewal of these accusations. They don't succeed. Here's another such example. And um, there, it's not that the, the church officials don't help them behind the scenes, but they do not succeed in getting official statements. And then in 1758, um, finally, there is a, hu a horrible wave of really horrific um, uh, executions and persecution of Jews. And uh, this um, Cardinal Lorenzo Ganganelli writes a report um, which he, um, in which he explains that Jews don't do st such stuff. There's historical evidence that they do, don't do such things and, the, and, the, uh, and these accusations are unjust. But this was an internal report. It was never released. It was written in Italian. It was never an official report. Jews were never, um, never notified about this report very explicitly saying that Jews do not kill Christian children for blood. And I found a smoking gun in the Vatican archives and the uh, archive of the Holy Office, which says that, that Jews should only be minimally informed about the existence of this report, if at all. So again, refusal to issue an official condemnation. Jews understood that such an official statement is necessary and they kind of did it on their own. That is, they uh, learned of a letter reporting to Poland from a cardinal to the papal nuncio that the Holy See examined and found that Jews don't do this, just a short letter. They got a copy, they inscribed the copy in official royal records uh, in Latin, then they had it, they got an official transcript from the royal letter records, then they tr uh, translated it also into Polish and published it in Latin and Polish uh, in this little publication to make something private um, official. Um, so how are these stories used in modern times? Um, in, anti, in today's anti-Semitic discourse, we, uh, uh, we often see that Jews are frequently accused of, of a number of, of things. And the Nazis uh, used these stories from these pre-modern chronicles that reported, reported these tales as evidence of the culpability of Jews for everything that the Nazis were accusing Jews of doing. 
And this is very much uh, taken, quite literally, these pre-modern sources were quite literally taken by the Nazis. There is a, an issue from Der Stürmer from May 1934, in which they use, and you can see the imagery uh, you, we see from the, that I showed you before, and here several pages of uh, what they say, um, uh, Jewish ritual murders from the time of Christ until 1932. And that what they do is that they list all these stories with a footnote or reference to the old chronicles, making them a fact uh, of uh, their own justification for anti-Jewish policies. And then that image that was forgotten, this one here of Simon of Trent, spreads like wildfire into in the fascist and Nazi propaganda. Here is an image from Italy, and here is an image from Poland. Um, both books were, the Polish book was definitely printed in the context of justifying the murder of Jews and and uh, and making the Polish population more um, uh, happy about it. Uh, but you can see the deployment of that 15th century image and you can see the deployment of the images from the earlier sources for Nazi propaganda to justify the murder of Jews. And this is, this is the, the root from which the neo-Nazis of today, the far right of today, get their knowledge about Jewish history. Uh, and here is the evidence that I mentioned to you, the Polish synagogue shooters a manifesto in which he says, you are not forgotten, Simon of Trent, the horror that you and countless ch children have endured at the hands of the Jews will never be forgiven. And then, uh, and then he, you know, he says that this is, this is why, among other things, the murder of Christ as well, why he is going to go on this shooting spree. So this is the, the story is this enduring tale that starts as tale as rumor in the middle ages. And then thanks to leadership or lack thereof, thanks to technology we see is disseminated across and really what I say is rooted in European Christian imagination and in European Christian thinking about Jews because no other stories are told. Only those nasty, horrible stories are told in Christian sources. So what are the lessons that are to, to, lear, to learn that I learned working on this book is that leadership matters and that, that the public pronouncements and the public um, steps that leaders make, whether it is a Pope condemning uh, anti-Jewish accusations or not condemning anti-Jewish accusations, whether it is a Bishop that seeks to promote and persecute Jews or someone who seeks to defend them. Um, and, and again, here is the impact of the papal bull and the uh, and the fact that once uh, once they stop those public pronouncements, the numbers go way up. The other thing is that it was very depressing for me to learn and to think about why people um, believed things that were clearly not true why people believed in things that even the popes condemned, that the emperors condemned. And I realized um, it was an aha moment that they were reading these chronicles, these authoritative sources of knowledge, and that's what made them believe in those, in those stories. Uh, they did not have any alternative sources of knowledge. So what they learn matters and what they read matters. And I'll show you the example. When you look at this map, the majority of the accusations happen in Eastern Europe. There are a couple of down in Italy in the 18th century. And there is one in Alsace. 
Uh, and in the Italian cases, Jews are not perse persecuted and killed. And in, in the Eastern European uh, cases, they are in many, many cases and in Alsace. Why is that? In German lands, there was a polyphony of voices. There were these anti-Jewish stories with the anti-Jewish imagery that I showed you, but there were also other stories and other, um, other books about Jews. Uh, those polemical ethnographies that were talking about Jewish customs and worship they, they're, and, and practices and rights. Um, but yes, they were, they were polemical, they were ridiculing these um, practices, but at the same time, many of the Christian writers had access to Hebrew writings and they were able to say, no, 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 Jews don't do such things. One of them wrote, hey, just, just, just don't do this on Passover. Passover matzah has only water and flour, and that's all. And it doesn't taste good, he, the Christian writer writes. Uh, people might disagree, but he knew that blood had no place in Jewish practice. In Italy, and here is the Johannes bookstore is the one that I mentioned, uh, mentioned who says that matzah doesn't taste good. Um, they were reading Christ, uh, Hebrew sources. They knew such things were not there. In Italy, the interest was to convert Jews. So the literature that was published was not talking about Jews killing Christian children, even though they had Simon, but rather it focused on polemical of how to convert Jews, try to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah. So these stories did not disseminate. This is not the case for Poland. The literature that was available about Jews in Poland was precisely the literature that told these anti-Jewish stories about Jews killing Christian children, about Jews doing all kinds of nasty things. And that's why it is not surprising that the majority of the cases happened in Poland. And the other lessons, the final lesson that I've taken is that visual culture matters and what we see is often far more powerful than what we read. Uh, and this is true, think about today's memes, uh, cartoons, and, uh, and, and all kinds of ways of hearing. And here is, here is another example. This was an example of the art of Simon of Trent that came in Italy. You can see that, yes, there's like blood here and nails here and a knife here, and maybe something not good is happening to or happen to that child, but it's not gore. It's focused on the worship, on venerating him as a saint or, a, or, or a blessed. This is very different from the iconography that is spread uh, uh, north of the Alps in, in German lands and in Eastern Europe. That iconography focuses on the cruelty of Jews, on, on how horrible they are, look how ugly they are, and the, uh, the suffering of the, of the Christian children. That is what uh, affects the emotional attitudes toward Jews uh, that does have an impact on the, the on modern anti-Semitism and modern imagination about Jews. And here is again, we are returning to that uh, translation of that imagery into the, the thing. So I'll stop here and I will am happy to um, entertain any questions. Uh well, thank you very much, Magna, for a wonderful, interesting, uh, haunting talk. Uh, we have quite a few questions. So again, uh, uh, um, our apologies if we can't answer all of them. Uh, but I, but I'd, like, I'd like to um, begin with a question from uh, Alejandro Baer, who, uh, who is... Um, uh, the director for the Center of Holocaust and Genocide Studies uh, here at the University of Minnesota, uh, thanking you for your, your fascinating talk. 
Uh, and it, uh, questions here are twofold, and I might even piggyback a little bit with these questions. Uh, so the first one is scholars tended to distinguish uh, between pre-modern and anti-Judaism and modern anti-Semitism. Uh, the continuities you have traced seem to blur the distinction. Is it at all uh, a helpful uh, temporalization? And, and I, I was kind of thinking also with the question is, um, you know, the question of continuities and its relevance today. Some of a lot of the questions are sort of uh, asking you about about that uh, as well. But also what what may be is different in the modern? Does it become maybe a more racialized myth when we, we think of modern uh, anti-Semitism as more perhaps more about race than religion or somehow racializing uh -huh. you know, the religious questions? Um, the this, the uh, second question, Alejandro's second question um, is that the, the Catholic Church is often reluctant to fully disown folk saints and surrounding cults whose origins are rooted in blood libels, for instance, the case in Spain. How do such attitudes differ in churches of countries in present day Europe? Mm -hmm. So I'll leave you with those. Okay, question. let's see what I, so the anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism question. It's a great question. And I, um, in, in working with the book is based on sources from i think in 10 or 11 languages from eight countries or something like that i lost track uh, but as you could see i was able to look at the various regions and what i found useful is to distinguish between anti-judaic polemic that is a polemic against judaism and that was that was uh, conversionary, that is to convert Jews away from Judaism. Uh, and that is the hallmark of Italian polemical literature. And that is the sort of classic pre-modern anti-Judaism. You want to convert Jews, um, right? You want, and they convert and they are happy Christians ever after and they are integrated. The story is more complicated as we historians know, but that's the, the idea. And then I distinguish uh, that anti-Judaic polemic with anti-Jewish polemic. So a, a polemic and writings that attack Jews as for the, what they do. So either they're uh, religious practices, how they practice it. It's not just theology, what they believe and whether Jesus is the Messiah um, and what the prophet said about it, but it's how they do things, what they practice, how they practice it. Or the more venomous uh, anti-Jewish literature like the one in Poland. Uh, and also, you know, it starts actually in Iberia with, with Alfonso Despina and many of the stories then enter, uh, enter the rest of European, um, European publications. Um, but that is then leads to, and that is the hallmark of Northern European and Eastern European literature. And that is what I think then helps this anti otherizing Jews as a people, uh, as a people who cannot be absorbed, like Italians can imagine converting Jews and being happy with them because they are Christians now, and that's the goal. Uh, so they are not totally otherwise, and it helps that, and they are visually in, in Northern Europe and Eastern Europe just uh, shown as looking differently. Um, so that later on in modern period, you have already a fertile ground of racializing Jews. And in the 18th century, you see uh, what, what I call de-Europeanizing Jews uh, by calling them Orientals, by calling them Asiatics. Uh, and that goes back to um, the thinking about Jews and Judaism as coming from the Holy Land, from, uh, from, uh, from Palestine. So I would distinguish that, but you can see that there are continuities and there are continuities of both the anti-Judaic strands in modern times 
Um, and I discuss it in a, there's an, a recent volume called The Key Concepts in the Study of Antisemitism. I discussed this uh, example there where uh, Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, goes and meets with the, the Pope. And the Pope says, I can't support your project, but we'll be ready for, for you to arrive to convert, right? So conversion is still seen as the goal until very recently, until just a few years ago in the Catholic Church, when the Catholic Church backed out of the conversion uh, uh, goal. Um, the other thing that continues into the modern times is that pre-modern imagery, right, that enters, that is created, the vocabulary, the, the, the um, visual vocabulary about Jews is developed first in the, the big nose in medieval period, and that's a fantastic book by Sarah Lipton, Dark Mirrors, that I highly recommend. And then it is uh, marshaled and used and deployed in the print and much more widely the, uh, disseminated. In terms of the, um, the uh, churches in Europe and how they, uh, the Catholic churches in Europe, um, the, it took uh, quite a bit of time to, um, to, to uh, abolish the cult, and it was abolished in the context of Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council, and the declaration of Nostra Aetate. In, in fact, the abolition of, the, of Simon happens on exactly the same date as the Nostra Aetate declaration, and then later on that leads to the abolition of another um, called in Inns near Innsbruck of Andreas Vorin, which is the second one recognized by the by the Pope. It's there are only two uh, veneration sites that were recognized by the Roman Catholic Church, one of Simon of Trent in 1588 and then one of Andreas von Rin in 1755. No other, and they are all uh, recognized as blessed, not saints. The, 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 the Pope, Pope Benedict the, the 14th, who was not the friendliest to Jews, uh, explicitly said that they can't become saints. And then there is Link, Hugh of Lincoln in England, and that's a, 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 an area of the Anglican Church. And after the Holocaust, that was uh, that the, some of the inscriptions were changed and, and the condemnations came in 1949, I believe. Great. Well, there, there are so many questions. I'm afraid I almost don't know where to begin, but the very interesting questions. One, uh, perhaps, um, it asks about the role of blood in, uh, in Christian ritual that, that might uh -huh. play a, played a part in, I guess, the reception of this. Yeah. Um, uh, and another, and, and there are a couple of questions also asking about um, sources, but but I think one one of the in interesting questions that uh, that uh, that's, that one of the uh, participants has um, is posed is about um, you know it really has to do about, about readership of this of this literature. Who is actually reading? Um, uh, I guess that speaks to the influence and how it was disseminated of this of this myth. So some of the some of the sources, literary sources. Okay, and the first one, uh, because I started thinking, I'm sorry, the first question you I The first question was about blood, blood. Okay, blood. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so, so yeah, that's a great yeah. question um, because it, it touches the core of, of the role, not of what Jews do, but what Christians do in the development of these stories. So just as with, again, I can't uh, stop recommending Sarah Lipton's book, but just as the development of this classic anti, what becomes anti-Semitic imagery, anti-Jewish imagery is part of, it, it develops in a moment of a very specific Christian need to, uh, to show the rejection of the worship of the suffering and, and very human Christ who is no longer God and Jews serve the iconographic description of depiction of Jews serve as the ones that look with disgust against, against uh, Christ. 
uh, the iconography de develops for very specific theological needs of Christians. And so too, the accusations against Jews. The 12th century, when, when the story emerges, what we see is the liturgical shift of Christians to um, focus on the passion of Christ, not the glory of Christ as God, but his suffering. And once you have the focus on the Easter story, well, just kind of enter the scene. And, uh, and we begin to see that in liturgy, as the Easter liturgy focuses on the passion of Christ, on the suffering of Christ, we begin to see that emergence of these stories that Jews are killing Christians to reenact annually this event that took place supposedly in Jerusalem. And then, but there's no blood motive at that point. It's just that crucifixion story. And one of the reasons why the story of William of Norwich reads so kind of familiar is because it's not because the story is already grounded, it's because when you read it carefully, he is using the liturgical Easter tropes and Easter uh, um, suffering uh, imagery that becomes more popular now in, in Europe. In the 13th century, the, the blood motif enters in the 13th century and uh, uh, mid 13th century. And that is the moment when the church is focusing on the blood in the Eucharist. 1215 is when the church officially commits itself to the doctrine of transubstantiation, saying that in the communion wafer, upon um, the consecration, there is actual body and blood of Christ. So matzah, like the Eucharist before, had only water and flour. Eucharist after in the 13th century now contains blood. So you begin to see that Jews now reenact, re they don't believe in it, but they want to have it. So they need to add Christian blood. So you have that connection, very close connection to that, that those new theological needs and new polemical needs. Very good. Well, I, I, oh, I, and uh, and the other one was on <laughs> on the sources. Who read them? So um, the the before print, they were all localized stories, and they may have been like one liners and chronicles that then then they translate. When it becomes printed, um, those those broadsides, just one sheet uh, visuals, would have been bought uh, by pilgrims and anybody could see and imagine. Those amazing chronicles are uh, read only by the educated. So one of the points that I, I it sort of realized uh, that while the traditional approach is that it is the uneducated who are promoting these anti-Jewish stories, it's the, the rabble, the people who don't know, it's exactly the opposite. It's those who learn, those who read, those who study. Those who encounter Jews every day are in fact saying, just, just don't do such stuff. We know what they do because we are close to them. It's those who read. And I found a fantastic passage in one of the Polish writers. So he goes to Western Europe and he suddenly is exposed to that Western literature about Jews and how horrible Jews are. And he writes, says, I am so lucky I survived. I used to hang out with Jews. I used to drink in their inns and with them. And my God, if I only known, I would have been so much more afraid of what they might do to me. So he is learning to, to hate and to think about Jews in a new way. And the trope of the rabble of the uneducated emerges in the early enlightenment. It's like, oh no, we're so sophisticated. No, it's just those uneducated peasants who do this. And that becomes a kind of a, a tool in promoting that becomes, becomes dominant. Well, well, thank you. We have uh, uh, probably another 20 
questions here, all of which are fascinating. So maybe as a, I'll, I'll try to um, combine some of this and-, and I'll take and I'll, notes this time. <laughs> uh, and and I, I was gonna say, uh, uh, you know, uh, people can certainly communicate your questions to me and I'll be I'll be happy to them. Yeah, and, and my email was on the slide mtetter at fordan.edu. So feel free to drop me a note as well. But um yeah, so I, I think maybe as a kind of final question, and I'm excuse me, I'm trying to maybe combine some different uh threads. Uh, but I I think that you know the interesting question about the transition to the modern. And I think the question of readership is is very, you know, interesting. You know, when print culture comes in, and of course, today all the social media, of course, mm -hmm. is 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 really important, and 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 the modern manifestations of anti-Semitism that that may or may not have a you know a, a direct link to. Um, um, uh, to to the blood you know to the medieval blood libel myth as it as it's manifested itself earlier. So not surprisingly, there are quite a few questions here about uh, the modern resonances and and even of course in the media recently there's been some dis discussion about uh, QAnon and and uh, so there are a few questions about about that is that a is that a modern manifestation of of the blood libel um myth um so i'll leave you with just the you know those sort of questions about the modern the trans mm -hmm. the now the transition of this myth into into um the the modern period and maybe you can leave us with a final a final kind of reflection um, yeah so I think as part of the final re reflection, what is striking about that, that story and that, that libel, that case, is that it becomes a very flexible vessel, right? It changes over time. It changes from the crucifixion and then as needs change, right? It, uh, it, to the use of blood and, and most of the time later on it sheds that classic features again Bayless case is a different case because it does have those classic features but the Tisa Eslar and the Polna and others they have very different different um 19th century or even the monk in in Damascus in 1840 have a very different uh flavor so what we see here today or uh and in Israel in the sort of lumping everything in that imagery um, and and the tropes of Jews killing uh, killing Palestinian children that is aimed at using that fertile ground. But today with the QAnon, it's interesting on, on a number of levels. Obviously, it you know the the story of conspiracy of someone like George Soros or prominent other prominent Jews, you know, controlling this this um, it, some people use Kabbal, which it signals something Jewish there from Kabbalah and the mystery and um, of a, a, of conspiracy that is about kidnapping children, right? So even if the if George Soros or Jews are not mentioned, when you have someone uh, hearing about these people who are kidnapping children, if they Google. Who kidnaps children? They will be led into the vortex of anti Semitic websites. And at some level, it, it, you don't have to be an anti Semite right away to get into the QAnon that wagon. You don't have to even think about Jews, but it, it, the path will lead you eventually there. And at some level, it mimics somewhat what the early modern readers were experiencing. Somebody may have bought the Hartman Shadows Chronicle or Cosmographia by Sebastian Münster and was just reading it because they wanted to learn history. They wanted to learn about the world, what it looks like and, and see things. But then 
in the middle of it, here and there, about just a dozen of stories, 11, 12 st stories, keep repeating it themselves. And these are the only stories about Jews that they kill, that they desecrate, that they... So it begins to create certain mental habits of thinking about Jews as these evil people that, you know, already pe people are aware of the theological aspect of Jews as Christ killers, supposedly. So it's fertile ground, but now it's reinforced when it starts. So even if they didn't go and look for, for Jews and were not anti-Jewish to begin with, these authoritative sources of knowledge that learned literature was telling them what Jews did. And that is, I think, that is, I think, why I've been, you know, saying that we need to expand our vocabulary of talking about Jews in society and in history beyond that vocabulary that has been formed by this pre-modern language in chronicles as Jews as these uh, as these people who are persecuted and condemned but of course from, from the Christian perception justifiably and that creates a certain way of otherizing Jews of ejecting them from as rightful members of society because they are perceived as dangerous and not bad. so I think that kind of uh, we see it percolating back and it's not surprising because as I said, the, the diet of where they get these stories comes from the neo-Nazi websites that draw on the Nazi literature and, and that's how do you combat that? Um, I think by flagging it, by uh, um, a Twitter did something during election, flag, flagging lies, something of that sort. So people who may not be pre predisposed to this message may be stopped and saying, hey, wait, maybe that's something that is not right and we shouldn't be going in this way. Well, I wanna thank you. Magna for Thank such you. a fascinating talk. Uh, we, we've really learned learned a lot about this. It's such a timely topic also. I want to uh, urge everyone to to read this this book, uh, Blood Libel, uh, which is uh, quite quite uh, quite an important work in in uh, Jewish history. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, uh, this lecture. I uh, hope to see you again in our future events. And thank, thank you so much, Magda. Thank you so much for having me. It was an honor. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. And please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.